Okay, uh, should I start? Yes, yeah. sure. Uh, my name is Norm Levy. I was born in Birmingham, England in 1927. Uh, I can tell you this, I was, my last year in school was when I was 12 years old. The war started and they evacuated the school to a mining village north of Birmingham. I stayed nine weeks, went home and got a job as a window cleaner. And I was then, how old was I? I was 12 years old. And then I uh, went uh, to a printing firm. And then I became interested when I was 14 in, uh, as a projectionist in a movie house and worked for that, did that work uh, until I was 16 years and 10 months and I went, I put my age up and went in the army October 43 and was demoted October 47. Uh, I served in Northwest Europe and India. Uh, in 48 I went to Israel. The, the, the thing was happening so I went and stayed till 51. And in 51, I came back to England and went in November of 51 to the United States. I had met a girl there who had gone back the year before and I went to New York. I had a 30-day visa, went to New York and she came in from Iowa. She had a scholarship at Iowa University. And then a month later, I, got, I entered Canada. It was very easy. I had a card, I gave it to the guy and he said, oh, okay, mate, away you go. And that was it. I mean, there were no points of whatever they did with these people. It was amazing. So I, I went and I lived in uh, uh, Toronto for about three months. My wife was still at school. And then I went to Montreal and got a job in a factory there. And I had applied to go to the United States. And uh, I had a hearing in uh, September 1952 in Montreal. I was still there. And I was turned down. And I said, why am I turned down? He said, well, we have the McCarran Act, another section, I think it was 28. Uh, we, we can deny you entry because of your background. I said, well, what about my background? <laughs> He said, well, we don't tell you that, that's okay. We, had, we, we get you to answer questions. So we were on the bridge in Montreal afterwards, and we tossed a coin. We'd either go back to Israel or go to Vancouver, where I had a friend who I served in the Israeli army with. So we went to Vancouver. And we got there in October 52, and uh, I worked on the waterfront for a couple of years, and would do two days, of, two half days of a week, uh, yes, a week, relief at the juvenile detention home. And after I'd been there, doing that for three years on the waterfront, I also modeled in the art school. It was two fifty an hour, but that was good money in those days, two fifty an hour. So I, uh, and then um, I got a job offer from the city of Vancouver at, at full time at the juvenile detention home. So I did that. And I stayed till the end of uh, 57 and we decided to go back. By then we had two children. Um, and we were living in Deep Cove in North Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I you know where that yes, is? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in 1965, well, no, we, were, we, were, we went to Israel there two years and then came home. And we stayed till 65 in. Uh, Deep Cove. In 1960, the John Howard Society offered me a job and I went to work with them and stayed till 72. I was elected to Parliament in uh, 50, uh, 68 in the by election. For what were what riding, Norm? Uh, yes, in Vancouver South. And then I got elected three more times. I was elected four times. Altogether. The last one was in 79. So, 68, 72, excuse me, 75, 79. And he got defeated in uh, 83 uh, by 
I'd serve you three votes. <laughs> That's politics, huh? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> by then I was, what, 50, uh, I was 53 years old. And I didn't really want to go back into uh, parole work, not at the uh, fishery shop. And I was living here. My wife and I had split up in 78. We had a house in Vancouver and one here because I was in the government. So I did bed and breakfast for about 10 years. And I was writing and doing research and stuff. And I've been here ever since. Yeah. That's great. It's a lovely house. Yes, well, it's it's 100 years old. Yeah. It, uh, well, it's got, you know, it's got a, well, the roof will have to be put on again. It was put the roof on about 10 years ago. But, uh, but there's this big tree and it's nice. And, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. But it's an awful big uh, thing to look after. We used to have a gardener when I was a minister, but uh, you know, I was making. Fi I went from eighteen thousand a year to fifty-five thousand just like that. <laughs> Three years, you know, because uh, we doubled the MLA salary, and it was the minister's salary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm. I just. I want to start before you go into politics with your work with the John Howard Society, because I'm, yeah. I'm interested that you, you in effect became a social worker without the... But I had no training. Yes. I had a lot of experience at the juvenile home, and there, you, they, you know, they took you on the basis of how old you were and what you were doing, and I'd been around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, when I went there, uh, Merv Davis, who was my boss, who was up in Campbell River now, he's 91 years old, and Come January, three or four of his ex-employers, including Dave Barrett, we go up to see him. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's a really interesting guy. Anyway, they did, um, the government in the 60s, uh, and some social workers started to talk about giving people who had experience, but no formal education in that sense, um, an opportunity to work as a social worker. I'm trying to think of the name of the thing. Uh, registered social worker. That's the name. I have a sticker here somewhere. And it arrived in 69. I remember it came to the office. And I said to my Davis, what's this? He said, oh, you got it. He said, we, I put in about three years ago for this. So that was, uh, I never used it, but anyway. So in the John <clears throat> Howard Society, did you have people who'd been in the mental health oh, system? Uh, no, we, every, we had one guy who started, oh, I started in 60, um, this guy started in 65, he was a former parolee of ours, and uh, we didn't take, we didn't deal that much with mental patients, so right. we didn't feel at the time we needed uh, anyone. Uh, we were mostly working with, but we worked with uh, mental patients and drug addicts and uh, that kind of thing. Um, because we were, well, we were, we were developing the resource wars and that's when I ran into the MPA. So, is it, so you, did you run into the MPA after the NDP government had been elected? Uh, yes, it was then okay. that we did the resource wars. Because there were the Socrates had no uh, had not reorganized the welfare system. Okay, so Norm, can you explain? You you were elected in seventy two. Yes. <coughs> well, I was first elected in yeah, but, but in seventy two, yeah. the NDP government comes into power under Dave Barrett. That's right. And you were minister minister, minister of. Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation and Social Improvement. Right. But you changed the name of the ministry yeah. to Human Resources. Can you explain to me the kind of what I would say the remit or the, 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 the what, what was the Ministry of Human Resources responsible for? Well, it was responsible for all the welfare side. The welfare issue, the money, the children taken into care, foster children. It, it controlled almost 6,000 Foster children. Mm -hmm. And Aboriginal people, you said? We did. Uh, the Aboriginals were included. We separated them afterwards, but they, were, they had their own ministry. And then we had three appointees from the professional union, and I can't remember the names now, 
but they, um, the first thing they did was um, the Indians were particularly annoyed about the children being adopted into white homes. <coughs> so we kicked it around quite a bit because you needed professional people to go into the house and look to see how it was. So we trained some Indian people to do that. By the time we'd left the government, it was, a, it was established that the first option was for Indian children to go to Indian uh, parents. It wasn't all that easy. No, it's tricky. You know, the, uh, there's a word in Arabic uh, called uh, alakithic. Alakithic means, yes, we can do it tomorrow, the next day, but don't rush it. You know, well, no, it's alakithic. And they were pretty uh, easy. Those that were speaking for it were enthusiastic. But the Indian people, the families, were quite a ways behind. They hadn't done much uh, propagandizing. Uh, of course, since that time, it improved greatly. Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at that time, we were still at the celebrating Frank Calder, who was the first Indian uh, man elected. And then there was an MP. But it went very slowly, and the integration with, the, with their own people was very difficult. Huh? A hard system. And then, of course, there was the whole issue of land settlement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it didn't go as fast as we'd hoped it would go. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's, we, put, we laid the groundwork, but it, uh, the Sokers, of course, were much more um, old fashioned way of dealing with Indians. You know, they were second class citizens, and that's how we do it. So, so the Minister of Health at that point, was that the NDP Minister of Health in that first, in, in, this, in 72, was that Dennis Cook? Dennis Cook. Cook. Yeah. And so he would, so in a sense, around mental health, you, you two kind of split up. Like well, he, he did the mental health. He, mm -hmm. he, he had a deputy minister for mental health. But I had always, there were always people phoning me because his operation was uh, more rigid than mine. And some of the people that I, that contacted me had known me at the John Howard. And I took over a couple of programs. For instance, uh, there was a psychiatrist over here, what's his name? He died recently. Um, I can't remember his name now. He was about 85, but he was a heck of a guy. He had the, see, I can't even remember the words. But the thing was, he felt that he could deal with some people with, uh, with drugs, and he was doing them. And he said, I can't remember the name, what he said. Well, it wasn't from, he wasn't from Saskatchewan. Well, he, he wasn't in Saskatchewan. It was, was it Hooper or was it uh, Chihuahua's, uh he was one of the guys uh, also who was with that doctor that ran that program uh, in Montreal. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Okay, so um, Ewan Cameron at the Allen? Ewan Cameron yes. was the guy, and he, and this guy worked for him. He okay, we singer. interviewed two, we've interviewed two psychiatrists in Vancouver who worked with Cameron. Yeah, in this guy is dead now. He yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, I know. I'll think of his name. Yeah. Again. But anyway, he... Uh, he had applied uh, to, to Dennis to get funding for his uh, program. Because when he contacted us, I said, look, it's a health matter. It's not something that I can do. But if I can help, call me. And he called me and said they won't finance it. And it, they've been raising money and trying to keep going. So I told Dennis and we, uh, we funded it and kept funding it until, well, they, I don't, while I was there, I don't think they took over the funding. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we had that. It was a difference of opinion that we had. Uh, Dennis, of course, had a, uh, a big ministry and uh, he decided to reorganize it in such a way that he would have a super deputy minister. So the bureaucratic process was rather complicated. Uh, but anyway, um, we did fund it, and I can't remember the name of the program. But anyway, uh, 
He lived just down the street here. So I'm wondering if it was through the Eric Martin or if Pardon? was was it through the Eric Martin? Oh no. No, uh, it was. I think he worked a little. Well, no, yeah. he did a lot of this in Vancouver. Oh, in Vancouver. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, I don't know. I'll think of his name. Mm -hmm. Doctor. I was going to say Gurevich, but it wasn't Gurevich. It was something like that. Yeah. So, I did a little bit of um, homework this morning, looking at uh, a publication from 1982 about the Greater Vancouver Mental Health Services, and it talks about the NDP coming into um, government. And I don't know how pertinent this is to your ministry, but that that the um, but I think it is that the NDP was committed to the devolution of of control, yeah. like to a local level in health and well, and everything. social it's services. The education system too. So yeah. can you do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because that's quite different. Then that's quite a shift, isn't it? It's well, I'll it. speak to the resource boards, which sure. of course was um, what we said was that there is too much of a pinnacle system, and you've got to work from some central office to get change, to get uh, action on something. For instance. When I was at John Howard and you wanted, they wanted extra money, the only extra money you could get in welfare was a, a special health grant. And that went from the social worker to the supervisor, the supervisor to the head guy in uh, uh, Victoria, and then he would discuss it with the deputy and then make a decision. Well, sometimes it never happened and sometimes it didn't, they turned them down. The first thing I did in the ministry, actually, uh, is I took away uh, and slipped up a little bit. I said that all workers, uh, you know, all experienced workers, who get a request for extra money, and if it seems to them it's legitimate because of the knowledge of their firm, they can institute up to $500. Without having to go well, back to okay. the, they have yeah. to notify Victoria, but uh, based on the regulations that we had developed, they could do it. So it went. We only had one uh, atrocious thing happen out in Delta, and I tried to fire the regional manager, and they said you can't fire him. I said why not? He says we don't have a process for firing mm -hmm. people. You've got to build a case. And they never built a case on this guy. This guy ordered about 25 canoes or something. He was doing a program with young kids. All right, we let him do it, but by God, it was a lot of money. And uh, so I had him come to my office and I said, I know, you know, I'd fire you if, if I could, but I can't. So I sent him some kind of, he wasn't married. But he was the brother, actually, of... Uh, he was the head of the social worker, Fred Bingham, yeah. And his brother was uh, a sort of an associate deputy minister in the ministry. So anyway, I said to him, I said, look, you, you've got an option. I said, you can't stay where you are. So he picked a place and we arranged for him to go there. But when I introduced that, I had forgotten about the, I had been really forgotten, but I didn't do what I should have done. Uh, they all got together at a meeting in Richmond and invited me to go talk to them. So I did, and uh, they said, you left us out of this thing. I said, well, it was implicit in the things that I said to them that uh, you wouldn't have a job. Mind you, I apologized too, because I didn't speak. I, I said, I'm apologizing now, because I never thought about it before. So anyway, one of the things that I did find out about these supervisors, these were the most experienced people on the line and they had a very small caseload. Uh, you know, I said, That's the, well, we can't have people of your experience and your training just supervising people. You know, how much supervision can you do anyway? So anyway, it, it settled down. And they, uh, after that, um, for the last, 18 months that I was doing uh, as a minister, we'd have every month about 30 people come from the field, line workers, 
would come, stay in Victoria three days and see me for two afternoons. And the only thing I said to him was, when you go back, don't say the minister said this or that or this or that. I said, I'm not enunciating policy. I'm just telling you the idea. And we got into this and it was very interesting because some ideas came from them once they got the opportunity to talk. So it, it, it was that part of the NDP yes. approach? We were moving towards decentralization, getting away from the business of calling Victoria at that time. And we did the resource boards and of course we were able to get a boost in developing them because there were a number of organizations that have developed them. And of course most of these organizations will say, well you don't need the board, we'll be the board. I said, oh no, we're going to go have elections. And we had elections in every place. In Vancouver, we had elections. Uh, so it gave uh, some people an opportunity to, to, co to compete. And also, uh, it looked like we meant business when we had. Uh, and of course, our turnout was very good. It was up to 40 or 40, 45%. Municipal elections was less than 20%. Can you describe for the, for the for the sake of the interview, can you describe the hum the community resource boards and their function? And well, uh, the, the Vancouver South is the, where we did the first one. That would be where I've been elected. And we had some interesting requests come out of there. One of them was that we pay the people. And I said, well, we're not getting into that now. We have, at the time I announced the uh, one that we were developing formally uh, in Vancouver South. There were a good, a good half a dozen, one in Kamloops, uh, um, Prince George, um, New Westminster, had developed, had committees that were sort of associated with the ministry in some kind of informal way, and they wanted to take over, not all of them. Some said, well, it would be, you know, election's a good idea. Uh, but uh, that's how it developed and it was useful for us because we didn't have to go out and propagandize. The press were reasonably good. Jack Webster was a jerk, but that's okay. I went on his program a few times, so it was all. But he uh, didn't understand what we were trying to do. Well, he always looked for a story and of course uh, it was a story that knocked the government, didn't matter if it was so great or the NDP, knocked the hell out of us. But other than that, um, it developed quite well. We had over 60 resource boards by the time we left office. So, so did the resource boards, with, is that how you connected with the Mental Patients Association? Were they well, yes, because the funding, they had to apply to the resource board for their funding. Stop coming to Victoria, but go to the resource board. And uh, we had said that... Uh, you know, when we worked at well, the biggest board we had was the Vancouver Resource Board, was chaired by Harry Rankin. Right. And we had we had um, uh, formerly I'd uh, taken a guy from uh, Edmonton who ran uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but he he was pretty good. Uh, we replaced him later with somebody who was uh, even a bit better, uh, but uh, it worked because. You had six resource boards in the Vancouver area because of the size of the city and New Westminster. So it worked fairly well. Occasionally people would phone me and say, look, we're applying for a grant. What's this? Yes, go there and do that. Well, don't, I said, I don't make grants anymore. I only approve the total grant money. I don't do individual things. Because it was madness when I was there. It was, uh, I'd have a group come over, or if, if I let them, every day. You know, asking for money and this and that. Well, the resource boards took that role over and did a fairly good job. Of it. So the philosophy behind the resource boards then was that local communities... Yes, control. Control? Yes. Because... And why did you guys think that was a good idea? Well, because we saw when we were there that either we were going to put this control, which it was, in the hands of two or three people, an endless amount of waiting time for anything. But we felt that you've got to decentralize, get people uh, who were good, if they were prepared to leave Victoria, fine, that's good. But otherwise, 
we wanted to decentralize it and speed up the process of it. The other thing was that it would leave some time for some workers to develop uh, some ideas, not necessarily line worker, but uh, there were more informal meetings going on. It was extremely popular in the ministry, you know, in, in the resource world. We brought a guy down from New Westminster, uh, from uh, Prince George, who had been the regional director and made him regional director of um, Vancouver because it was a pretty tough thing to handle, but he did extremely well. Mm -hmm. yeah, as a matter of fact, I ran, I ran into him about a year ago. He's retired now. In, <laughs> Do you re can you recall his name? I'm trying to remember it. I'm sorry. I've got it written down somewhere. But, uh, okay. Uh, so There is a guy you can talk to who, uh, I'll give you his name, Joe D'Onofrio. Mm -hmm. When I was a minister, I had two assistants. I had Joe D'Onofrio. Mm -hmm. uh, D'Onofrio, he was... Uh, in Vancouver. He was worked with Harry Rankin. He and Rankin were, worked extremely well together. And I had my own assistant here in Victoria, Ray Wargo. Mm -hmm. And he wound up, he, after we went out of government, he went to work at the ministry and finished up a supervisor or something. Who was the Deputy Minister of Health then? Deputy Minister, Minister of Health. Who there were was three Deputy Minister? Ministers of Health. But the one involved the, with mental the, health. I can't remember his name. Oh, but, okay. Uh, he was the super deputy. He had been a deputy and he, put, he made him a super deputy. Because yeah. that would be an interesting interview to. to uh, yes, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, if the person's still alive. Uh, yes, well, uh, we went to 72, what's that? That's 8, 80, 30. That's 38 years ago since we were elected. Mm -hmm. And I was only 44 or something like that. <laughs> Exciting times, huh? I'm 83 now. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing pretty well. You're doing well. It's, so uh, yeah. so I, the, the piece that I was reading were about these community, uh, community mental health centers, of which there was one in Kitsilano. And I was interested in when I, because, and this makes sense to you with what you're talking about, right. was they talked about how there was um, a lot of flexibility in terms of getting funding, that, um, that they could use um, money that wasn't spent during the budget year, that it wouldn't all go back to the treasury, that there was this flexibility. Yes, right. um, yes we changed that a bit, yeah. 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 So, you know, that it seems that what what was happening with the resource boards is there was that same flexibility in mental health. Well, the people health. that can tell you most about the, the, the kids thing would be Ray Wargo and Joe D'Onofrio. They were good okay. friends. They worked together for Children's Aid, actually. And uh, they they know about that. And yeah. the Harry Rankin thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Rankin's dead now, but the thing is, uh, it, between the two of them, they can tell you quite yeah. a bit. Yeah, yeah. Because I know that the... Mental Patients Association, the MPA, certainly got money from Harry Rankin. Like that was one of the oh, yeah. places that they got funding from. I remember once Harry Rankin uh, uh, turned down a grant, um, which we had uh, we had approved previously, but it hadn't quite got off the ground. And when they came, went to him to get it, they said he said no, and they came to see me. Now it, the program was by. Um, three professors from the university were, wanted to start a club, a similar club that existed in Vancouver, where they had homosexual uh, young people. They wanted to keep the young people out of the main thrust of what was going on with homosexuals, and he turned them down. No, he didn't turn them down. First of all, he said you, he put the money under the, res uh, not the, what's it called, the emergency board. Uh, it was, the, the, their money would be supervised by this board. And these were bright, capable people. So I saw so the company, said, well, why did you let, them, why don't you let them run the company with their own money? He said, well, you know, he was a bit embarrassed by this. And I said, come on, Harry, what's going on? 
He said, well, uh, I said, it's the business of these guys being uh, queer that was going up, I decided. And he looked at me and he said, well, he said, I don't think they're going to like us. Yeah, I said, don't start. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you tell them that they're going to supervise their own money. <laughs> and, he went, and eventually he, uh, he did. You know, he, he was a good guy that met a rank in the but occasionally he was like everybody else. They had a, you know, kind of, because where he was raised, he was raised in the East End of Vancouver, where they opposed everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, he, was, he did okay. So w before we started this formal interview process, you were talking about um, Essendale or Riverview and the, the, the shift from institutional to community care, yeah. um, which of course is happening very much at the same time as when the NDP comes into power and you were involved in those circles. So I wonder if you wanted to just talk a bit about that process and, and how, how you remember it. Well, I remember that it wasn't, uh, there were very few people getting out when we were government, very few. Uh, but we focused more on, well, what's going to happen to them when they're in the community? Uh, that's uh, when they, they constantly came to see me to see how much money we could provide for group homes. And then I became interested, because uh, we I get, Complaints of the minister um, was, it, was kind of brutality, was the one phrase that was used in uh, near Kamloops, there was a place, and also uh, one or two complaints from Woodlands about the patients being manhandled and that kind of stuff. And then I eventually went out to, uh, well, I went to three places altogether, but I stayed at Woodlands. Because that was the one that struck me that uh, it wasn't really, uh, there weren't programs for everybody, for instance, uh, autistic kids were mostly in a bullpen, uh, kind of a, and I used to go in there and wander around, they didn't talk to me very much, and then if I stood outside the cage, it was like a pretty uh, big cage. Uh, They'd interact a little bit with one another, but there was no program. Uh, and that, of course, was in 75 when I was there. So we, we spoke to the director, and uh, she couldn't get the money, of course. Uh, with us, we had the money, so we got around to it. It was, you know, it was always difficult to do things. It's not the question of whether you've got the money, or whether you can have the time to pay attention to it because everything was coming back to Victoria for approval. So was this, was one of the places where there were stories about brutality, was that in boarding houses that patients coming out of Riverview would have gone to? Well, we worked, uh, you know, there had to be an alternative to the uh, occasional cases. They weren't that frequent, but they did come up. Um, the question was, well, where would they go? Uh, usually you had to move the worker. You couldn't, um, you know, you take a look at the patient and see whether at this time, if you can get a group home, they should go there because they were suffering also from some of the brutality. We had quite a number of uh, group homes for the, these people. And of course, uh, when I see the street people, I begin to realize that uh, we, we helped to, we didn't quite come to get, get the thing together in the beginning. Because uh, you, you can't always do things as fast as you want, but, uh, and we didn't always tell, people didn't always tell us, you know, it was hard to find out what went on in the ministry. It wasn't that people didn't know, they hadn't bothered to find out. And we, of course, couldn't look at everything clearly. I remember I did the, the, the first piece of legislation was in October 1972. We created the Income Act. We delivered the checks on the 8th of December uh, that year to 108,000 people, supplement to their income by 38 or 40 bucks. Um, 
And because we uh, then said that uh, the cost of living would be added when, when necessary. Um, we wanted to do that and do it quickly uh, because it was a, a large number of people and if we had delayed it we'd have got a lot of flack. Ironically when we lost the election we lost a third of the old people. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was a tough, tough decision. But anyway, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about this, and he knew a fair bit about it, except he didn't know why we called the election. Uh, well, it's not generally known, but uh, Barrett uh, was heading for a deficit, and W.A.C. Bennett had left us a time bomb. He said, when you have a deficit, you have to call the House together. Uh, if it's adjourned, and ours was, and explain with a bill well, how you're going to get uh, paid the debt. And uh, that was the big argument in Cabinet. Seven meetings we had. And then we finally said to the Premier, you're the Premier, you do it. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the MPA would have come to you for funding yes. for 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 running for uh, employment was, programs. Yeah. Um, employment programs they go to labour. Oh, okay. So what? So sort of. So what programs did they come to you for funding for? Well, did initially they, they came because I was a good guy and I'd give them money. Uh, right, you were more approachable than the Ministry uh, of Health. Yeah. Well, they didn't know. For instance, Bill King well, it wasn't that knowledgeable about it, but he eventually funded labour programs. Yeah. Okay, so you so that you mostly worked with Lanny Beckman and Barry Cool and Stan. There was a woman I met, uh, I dealt with. Uh, uh, she's connected with this uh, operation in Vancouver. The uh, it's like a trust fund. I don't know what like the Vancouver they put, uh, Yeah, I'll go and get one of the magazines. Uh, what was her name? Cohen, Marcy Cohen. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So was she from the MPA as well? Not the MPA. Oh, okay, no. okay. Oh, no, country. <laughs> okay. So Lanny, but uh, do you think one of the reasons Lanny came to you as well is because... I well, mean, they I, were... I don't remember that. I don't recall that Lanny actually came to me in the beginning. Somebody came for him. Somebody, uh, oh, I spoke to including Jacques Gouri. Right, okay, friend. okay. Yeah. Yeah. You see, the John Howard was a very interesting place for me to work at because it exposed you to all sorts of other operations, which was all part of the business of, of centralizing everything, everybody controlling. When we decentralized, they didn't have anything to do with uh, people with special problems and that kind of thing. We, we divided the social workers into teams, three or four teams, and these three or four teams would look after a number of problems, but they were there. And in uh, Vancouver Resource Board, we might have as many as 20 teams. Yeah. Well, it was a good thing that we did uh, central, uh, decentralize. You know, for instance, I had an overrun of $100 million. The year before, the SOCLEDs had 75, and they had done no new programs. We had done new programs, and we also, in June of 1973, increased the uh, welfare uh, amount. So, you, so under, under the NDP, a whole bunch of new social programs. That's the sense I get. Yeah. We, had, we introduced 18 new programs in the, in the ministry. Do you remember, are there some that you'd like to well, talk about? Well, for instance, about? one of the things we did in the early beginning was a subsidy within the daycare centre operation so that people who, for instance, we actually had at one time uh, paid a subsidy to three or four families that, whose husbands were working part-time at the IWA, but they weren't making enough to, because they had three or four kids, and a couple of them should, have, should be in daycare. So we gave them the subsidy to do that. Now that wasn't 
prevalent, but we did it. That's mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. flexibility there was. And um, we, special services for children was the key thing. The one that I was most interested in because you could provide a worker for, for instance, I, I can remember when I was do, dealing with families of guys that were being released. And I'd say to myself or to somebody, I'd say, oh, we'd really get somebody in to help this family. And he's not reacting too well. He's been away four years or three. And we put somebody in again. Uh, it was ironical. We found this retired carpenter and he went to see the family. And it wasn't easy, but my God, they did well. And they were just a couple of days a week. And that had, I can't remember, that. Joel will tell you how many uh, contracts we had. Um, because that was the busiest uh, area, was the Greater Vancouver. In fact, more than half of the program at that time was in the Vancouver area. Yeah, it was the biggest. We did a study of how many kids were sent away from the north to wound up in the south and uh, in foster homes and bounced around and in YOU institution in Ocala and this kind of thing. Yeah, it was tough. So we straightened that out quite a bit. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of what, I'm wondering what else I, because I feel like there's more stuff that you could tell me about mental health in that Well, period. I'm not, you see, I think you should really talk to Joe mm -hmm. and to um, uh, Ray, because I can remember, that I remember more when I was a young Howard, you know, giving them a hand or that kind of thing. Um, but uh, those two, if anybody knows, because what's his name is dead now, so, but uh, those two should know something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so your work with the John Howard, you worked with people who'd been in the mental health system or you, di or you didn't? Well, we had uh, parolees uh, who had, um, had a series of, me of mental health episodes. And uh, we occasionally got, because some conditions of parole was that they see a psychiatrist, so we arranged for that. Uh, so, but not on such a broad scale. Um, because the mental health thing, uh, there were a number of, not mental health, but something similar for young kids. Yes. You know, there were all sorts of things going on. And of course at that stage, nobody had really taken up, even when we were there. Like for instance, I ran a group in the pen of habitual criminals. And we had all, nearly all of the habitual criminals in Canada were in, in British Columbia. We had that bastard Bonner and the guy that, and the mayors, and between them, uh, well, uh, what's his name? He became a judge afterwards. Uh, uh, he was the city prosecutor of Vancouver. They were using this blebby thing to just clear the streets. You know, and they, we had two, I had two guys commit suicide in Ocala. They'd serve you a paper and they were saying that you were convicted of three indictable offences of, of, for a sentence of more than five years and on the next sentence, uh, on the next uh, crime, if you, you were committed and that, uh, so that we're going to find that you're an original criminal. They also wanted to do one with drug addicts, if you got more than three convictions for possession. And on the fourth conviction they could move against you. But they never actually, uh, um, what's the word, Bring the, brought the act, the, the amendment to the act. In. That was on the day before. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, it would have been terrible. We would have, we would have had, well, a couple of hundred and easy, just uh, guys that were. So that's the kind of thing we became aware of. For instance, when they opened up the new prison in Abbotsford. Um, what's it called? Uh, well, Masqui? Uh, Masqui. Yeah. They wanted to turn it into a drug addicts uh, pen. And we as an agency opposed it. And yet we got our money from the same corrections. Uh, mind you, they kept rattling it. And Murph, the director, would say, well, we're getting a hell of a lot of flack for this. I said, well, it's ridiculous. How can you do that? 
you know, they did it initially, just um, send a few guys out. And all of a sudden, in the John Howard, we had guys that couldn't speak a word of bloody English, wanted some help, you know, because they, they had to finish their sentence in what was going to become the drug addict's prison. Well, that was just ridiculous. Yesterday, anyway. yesterday we interviewed a, a, a lawyer called Sid Philclove, who was Lanny Beckman's cousin, oh, yeah. but he um, he worked. Uh, I mean, he did some advising for the Mental Patients As Association, but also served on the Riverview Revo Review Board oh, and yeah. on review boards at the prison. Um, were you involved in any of that kind of work? No, I was just going to say that one guy you should talk to who knows about is Sid Simons. Sid the lawyer. Simons. Sidney Simons, I believe somebody told me the other day, I think he's over here, he, he moved to Victoria. A lawyer. A lawyer, Sid Simons. Sid must be my age, well maybe not quite as old as me, but uh, he took a lot of official criminal cases, he, did, he was a specialist in uh, um, drug trafficking and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But he knows some of the stuff and uh, yeah. I used to help him occasionally or you know, when we had a guy who was being made an habitual. You know, there was a, there was a kind of a trial. Yeah. I think that, I mean, to me, the 1970s um, are what, what I think Ed Broadbent would say is this evolution of a more rights-based society. And I'm, my sense is that this is a, a moment when People look at you know people in the prison system and and mental health patients and see them as people with rights in a way that they didn't before. Well, uh, the John Howard Society started in thirty one. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Hopton started. They didn't release the first pre release guy on parole from the pen till about nineteen fifty seven fifty eight, but one of the John Howard workers took him out. And brought him back, you know, that was uh, he coming back, you know. And uh, the thing is that by in 19, I think it's 1990, a guy that was a former colleague of mine in the legislature um, became a judge of the Supreme Court. He had been an MP. I think he was, he's dead Berger. now. No, not Berger. No. Um, Anyway, he headed a commission to look at the Habitual Criminal Act and his function was what is the value of it and what is dangerousness and which of the men you are looking at, and there were about 80 in the pen, say which you feel are, are dangerous, meet the criteria. And he did, he, he said only six. And the rest were released, and they were doing life on parole. These guys. So, the, with the NDP, um, do you think that uh, devolution uh, to the local level was one of the biggest legacies of one your of the government? Biggest? Uh, legacies. You yes, know. I. That's well. We, you know, there are a number of John Howard societies now. This is probably because this is thirty years after what we're talking about. But in those days it was difficult because the prison system was highly centralised, the parole system was centralised, and we were there trying to work our way through this system. I went down once, they, they, they did uh, agree to see us. I took my kids down because we were going to visit my mother-in-law. So I took the two oldest ones with me and uh, they were playing in the boardroom <laughs> while I was talking to these guys. and. They felt, uh, finally, and we had said to them years before, you know, operating a central parole board for this, for this operation is, why, is not, uh, doesn't work. First of all, it's too much of a load on one group, and the thing is, it slows down the process. <laughs> so they've done some things, but they're still highly centralised. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the parole board is under the... Uh, correction system now. No, well, you know, I guess people who are running these things, 
they don't all work themselves out of a job. Uh, the, the, I've noticed with some that there's a limit to how far they will go before they shut up. And uh, it's even today with the younger people. In fact, it's much, it's much more cohesive now. But uh, we were a bit of a, you know, we were a little bit outside the system and uh, we were interested enough. For instance, we had a guy with us, I was reading yesterday, my son, my son got remarried after 10 years and uh, Tony Holland, you ever heard of him? He's no. an actor. He worked with us from 60 to 65 and when the opening came up to start an act, uh, a theatrical school at the college, he was appointed and he did it. He was the former deputy head of the Old Vic School in London, which is a very famous school. And uh, he, uh, he ran, uh, when he came out here in 58, 59, he eventually ran a group, not 58, 59, uh, oh that's right, 58, 59. He ran a group at the Handy Correctional Institute that won the Dominion uh, Theatrical Award for 1964. And he had this going in three or four institutions. And we were pushing it, and you know, those bastards did not have it. Finally, they climbed on the bandwagon, but it was difficult. You know, there, there has always been this kind of antagonism because it's, it's, it, it appears to us to be still highly centralized, and mm -hmm. it is highly. I have not found, in my view, that uh, they have relaxed anything. Uh, sure, they're dealing with more inmates, but you've got to talk to the judges. Endless discussions and corrections over the last 50 years on why does Canada have the second or third highest number of people in jail? Canada, oh my God, 10, 20 years ago we only had about, uh, you know, we had a small population. In fact, they announced yesterday we've got 34 million. And we, we are number three. The Americans have over a million, the Russians have over a million, and we have the... Uh, We're the third? Uh, in jail. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, the, the Americans are on the way to two million. Because when the Russians, under the old system, they had the whole works, but it doesn't work there. Like, well, Siberia is now shut down. Yes. Yeah. Now look, do get in touch with uh, Wargo, he's in the phone book in Vancouver. Okay. And Joe D'Onofrio um, is in the phone book in Richmond. How do you spell his name? D'Onofrio, D-E-N, O-F, D'Onofrio, R-I-O. Oh. Okay. It's the na same name as the guy that was in that uh, TV show where he's the Mafia family or something. Richmond. Oh, uh, yeah. right. In, he, yeah. He, he'll be there now because he's, he always goes to Phoenix, Arizona from October to May, March or May. Uh, I, uh, yeah. Home. yeah, because I, I do think it's the, the, the timing for the NDP government to come in is quite it's got to be an important part. Like it seems that mental health services were being re reordered under the SOCREDS, but <laughs> but the community focus um, well, has got to be an NDP piece. You to have some to extent. remember that when the seventy two election came along, uh, Bennett was obviously had some problems within his party. He and um, Minister of Transport, what was his name? First of all, in 1972, Bonner had gone. He'd been gone about three years. He was the head of uh, Mac and Blow. And uh, then he was having trouble with this guy that had been his transport minister. And when he was transport minister, or highways minister, he did well. Gallardi? Gallardi. Yeah. Uh, they were fighting before the election and once or twice in the election. But the other thing was that caused their defeat wasn't uh, that the Conservative Party ran some candidates and they hadn't run in over 20 years. And they took 11% of the SOCRED vote away. Is that, and was that's that what we won. 
Was that Scott Wallace? Was he? Scott Wallace mm -hmm. was the um, head of the conservative, conservative party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's his, I couldn't remember his name. Now Scott Wallace. The thing is, without that, we would not have won. We, if there hadn't been a Conservative Party, I doubt we would have won. Because we didn't realise until somebody told us on the Thursday before the following Wednesday when the election day was going to happen, that we were going to win. But he said, and he was our PR guy, he said, I think you're going to win. And of course when we did, we were very surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, when we went in, <laughs> into the... Uh, cabinet room uh, when we were sworn in and we were sworn in in the building and, we went in. and uh, they cleared everybody out except the uh, Barrett's assistant and there was a bit of a silence and somebody said uh, well what do we do now <laughs> <laughs> and Ernie Hall who was the provincial secretary he weighed about 300 pounds he was a big fella and he struggled up he says, well, he said, I guess we better make an agenda. Here's one. And he held up the paper. And that was the agenda we used in the, for over three years we were government. Yeah. Look, we, we, we were said in an article in The Sun in January of 1976, we brought about 80% of the programs we had passed in our conventions, and that's true. You know, for instance, we took a, a, a piece of the Attorney General's office, which was running a little consumer affairs thing, and we created a ministry uh, because it was necessary. God, it was the topic of the day, of, uh, had been for some years. And then, of course, we, uh, because I can't remember everything we did now, that's the trouble. Um, but those two guys will remember. I know, but, but it is true. If you look at the NDP government in Ontario and in BC, those NDP governments were incredibly active in terms of new programs and, and, and policy yeah. initiatives. Yeah. The one thing, we, when we look at uh, the guy that was the NDP Premier, the thing was, you see, our party in some ways is split into two. You've got the East and you have the rest. Now you have the Far East, because we've got a government in Nova Scotia. But when we were government, there were two other governments that were NDP. And with the, our, the work that we did together with the Quebec people, we had four governments, nearly half of the population of Canada representing us. And we were sort of on our way. The only thing is that the NDP separately didn't meet that often. And that was a, 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 the unfortunate part. The other thing was, of course, in Ontario, when he became the government, uh, uh, and I'm not sure, sure why it all happened, except that the uh, right wing deteriorated somewhat. And of course, and there was a the federal government at the time that was in um, He uh, he took on some of the people as enemies that he should never have done. Of course, he, the thing was, part of the reason he got elected was because of the unions, but some of his anti-union talk in the end uh, helped defeat him. Well, and I think the other thing is, there's somebody at the door. The other thing was that, uh, you know, I mean, it was really tough economic times that Bob Ray had to deal with, right? There's a certain irony about what happened there because uh, Stephen Lewis, who turned out to be a first-class individual, never quite got, to, he was leader of the opposition, but he never got a chance to be the government. Yeah. Somebody's here to see you. And we're almost And we're almost out, we're almost out of time. <laughs> what? I think we're out of tape. Oh. And okay. there's somebody here to see you. Hi, Peter. Hi. It's a friend of mine. Hi. 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 We've just He's seen a retired you. bush pilot. <laughs> wow. So yeah. whereabouts did you fly? Forty yeah. odd years, yeah. He's up and down the BC coast. Yeah. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah. Tell me, what do you do? <laughs> you. This is 
is my daughter, Mab. Oh, she's just watching <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh. I didn't introduce you because we were just getting into this thing, but, um, but she ended up coming along today. Yes. Yeah. Where do you live? Where do you live? Back in? You live back in? Well, we live in the winters. We live in Toronto, and we spend our summers on Hornby Island up the coast, which you that's, might know from your flying days. That's yeah. where the former premier lives. Really? Harcourt, where does he live? Doesn't he live on Hornby? No. Oh, no, no. I had a friend, a carver, lived on uh, A carver? Uh, my, uh, what's his name? Teddy Mahood. He was I a carver. Right, right. Yes. No, I don't think Harcourt... No, I don't no, Harcourt, Harcourt lived in uh, another place.